Hey, it's Brett. Welcome back to Brett and Some Books. Today we are on chapter 10 of Prince Caspian, the second story in the Chronicles of Narnia. This is called The Return of the Lion. To keep along the edge of the gorge was not so easy as it had looked. Before they had gone many yards, they were confronted with young fir woods growing on the very edge, and after they had tried to go through these, stooping and pushing about for ten minutes, they realized that in there it would take them an hour to do half a mile. So they came back out and out again and decided to go around the fir wood. This took them much farther to their right than they had wanted to go, far out of sight of the cliffs and out of the sound of the river, till they began to be more afraid they had lost it altogether. Nobody knew the time, but it was getting to the hottest part of the day. When they were able at last to go back to the edge of the gorge, nearly a mile below the point from which they had started, they found the cliffs on their side of it a good deal lower and more broken. Soon they found a way down into the gorge and continued their journey at the river's edge. But first they had a rest and a long drink. No one was talking any more about breakfast or even dinner with Caspian. It may have been wise to stick to the rush instead of going along the top. It made them sure of their direction and ever since the fir wood they had all been afraid of being forced too far out of their course and losing themselves in the wood it was an old and pathless forest and you could not keep anything like a straight course in it patches of hopeless brambles fallen trees boggy places and dense undergrowth would be always getting in your way but the gorge of the afternoons of the rush was not at all a nice place for traveling either. I mean, it was not a nice place for people in a hurry. For an afternoon's ramble ending in a picnic tea, it would have been delightful if everything, it had everything you could want on an occasion of that support. Rumbling waterfalls, silver cascades, deep amber-colored pools, mossy rocks and deep moss on the banks, in which you could sink your ankles. Every kind of fern, jewel-like dragonflies, sometimes a hawk overhead, and once Peter and Trumpkin both thought an eagle. But of course, what the children and the dwarf wanted to see as soon as possible was the great river below them and Baruna along the way to Aslan's Howe. As they went on, the rush began to fall more steeply their journey became more and more of a climb and less and less of a walk. In places, even a dangerous climb over a slippery rock with a nasty drop into dark chasms and the river roaring angrily at the bottom. You may be sure they watched the cliffs on their left eagerly for any sign of breakage or any place where they could climb them. But these cliffs remained cruel. It was maddening because everyone knew that if once they were out of the gorge on that side they would have only a smooth slope and a fairly short walk to Caspian's headquarters. The boys and the dwarf were now in favor of lighting a fire and cooking their bear meat. Susan didn't want this. She only wanted, as she said, to get on and finish it and get out of these beastly woods. Lucy was far too tired and miserable to have any opinion about anything, but there was no dry wood to be had. It mattered very little that anyone thought. The boys began to wonder if raw meat was really as tasty as they had always been told. Trumpkin assured them it was. Of course, the children had attempted a journey like this a few days ago in England. They would have been knocked up. I think I have explained before how Narnia was altering them. Even Lucy was, by now, so to speak, only one-third of a little girl going to boarding school for the first time and two-thirds of Queen Lucy of Narnia. At last, said Susan. Oh, hooray, said Peter. The river gorge had just made a bend and the whole view was spread out beneath them.
They could see open country stretching before them to the horizon, and between it and them, a broad silver ribbon of the great river. They could see the specially broad and shallow place which had once been the fords of Baruna, but was now spanned by a long, many-arched bridge. There was a little town at the far end of it. By Jove, said Edmund, we fought the Battle of Baruna just where that town is. This cheered the boys more than anything. You can't help feeling stronger when you look at a place where you won a glorious victory, not to mention a kingdom hundreds of years ago. Peter and Edmund were soon so busy talking about the battle that they forgot their sore feet and the heavy drag of their mail shirts on their shoulders. The dwarf was interested too. They were all getting on at a quicker pace now. The going became easier. Although there were still sheer cliffs on their left, the ground was becoming lower on their right, so it was no longer a gorge at all, only a valley. Then there were no more waterfalls, and presently they were in fairly thick woods again. Then, all at once, a sound rather like the stroke of a woodpecker. The children were still wondering where, ages ago, they had heard a sound just like that, and they disliked it so. When Trumpkin shouted, Don! At the same moment, forcing Lucy, who happened to be next to him, flat down into the bracken. Peter, who had been looking up to see if he could spot a squirrel, had seen what it was. A long, cruel arrow had sunk into a tree just above his head. As he pulled Susan down and, whisked and dropped himself, another came rasping over his shoulder and struck the ground at his side. Quick, quick, get back, crawl, panted Trumpkin. They turned and wriggled along uphill under the bracken amid clouds of horribly buzzing flies. Arrows whizzed round them. One struck Susan's helmet with a sharp ping and glanced off. They crawled quicker. Snow or sweat poured off them. Then they ran, stooping nearly double. The boys held their swords in their hands for fear they would trip them up. It was heartbreaking work. Up, all uphill again, back over the ground, so they had already traveled. When they felt that they couldn't really run any more, even to save their lives, they all dropped down in the damp moss beside a waterfall and behind a big boulder, panting. They were surprised to see how high they had already got. They listened intently and heard no sound of a pursuit. So that's all right, said Trumpkin, drawing a deep breath. They're not searching the wood. Only sentries, I expect. But it means that Moraz has an outpost down here. Bottles and battle doors, though. It was a near thing. I ought to have my head smacked for bringing us this way at all, said Peter. On the contrary, your majesty, said the dwarf. For one thing, it wasn't you. It was your royal brother, King Edmund, who first suggested going by Glasswater. I'm afraid the DLF's right said Edmund, who had quite honestly forgotten this ever since things began going wrong. And for another, said Trumpkin, if we'd gone my way, we'd have walked straight into that new outpost most likely, or at least had just the same trouble avoiding it. I think this glass water route has turned out for the best. A blessing in disguise, said Susan. Some disguise, said Edmund. I suppose we'll be we'll have to go right up the gorge again now, said Lucy. Lou, you're a hero, said Peter. That's the nearest you've gone today to saying I told you so. Let's get on. As soon as we're well up into the forest, said Trumpkin, whatever anyone says, I'm going to light a fire and cook supper, but we must well get away from here. There is no need to describe how they toiled back up the gorge. It was pretty hard work, but oddly enough, everyone felt more cheerful. They were getting their second wind, and the word supper had a wonderful effect. 
They reached the fir wood which had caused them so much trouble while it was still daylight and bivouacked on a hollow just above it. It was tedious gathering the firewood, but it was grand when the fire blazed up and they began producing the damp and smeary parcels of bear meat which would have been very unattractive to anyone who had spent the day indoors. The dwarf had splendid ideas about cookery. Each apple, they still had a few of these, was wrapped up in bear's meat as if so to be an apple dumpling with meat instead of pastry only much thicker and a spiked on a sharp stick then roasted and the juice of the apple worked all through the meat like applesauce with roast pork bear that has lived too long and too much on other animals is not very nice but bear that has had plenty of honey and fruit is excellent and this turned out to be that sort of bear. It was truly a glorious meal, and of course no washing up, only lying back and watching the smoke from Trumpkin's pipe and stretching one's tired legs and chatting. Everyone felt quite hopeful now about finding King Caspian tomorrow and defeating Miraz in a few days. It may not have been sensible for them to feel like this, but they did. They dropped off to sleep, one by one, all, but all pretty quickly. Lucy woke out of the deepest sleep you can imagine, with the feeling that the voice she liked best in the world had been calling her name. She thought at first it was her father's voice, but that did not seem quite right. Then she thought it was Peter's voice, but that did not seem to fit either. She did not want to get up, not because she was still tired, on the contrary, she was wonderfully rested, and all the aches had gone from her bones, but because she felt so extremely happy and comfortable. She was looking straight up at the Narnian moon, which is larger than ours, and the starry sky, for the place where they had bivouacked was comparatively open. Lucy came the call again, neither her father's nor Peter's. She sat up trembling with excitement but not with fear the moon was so bright that the whole forest landscape around her was almost as clear as day though it looked wilder behind her was the fir wood away to her right the jagged cliff tops on the far side of the gorge straight ahead open grass to where a glade of trees began about a bow shot away lucy looked very hard at the trees of that glade why, I do believe they're moving, she said to herself. They're walking about. She got up, her heart beating wildly, and walked towards them. There was certainly a noise in the glade, a noise such as trees make in a high wind, although there was no wind tonight. Yet it was not exactly an ordinary tree noise either. Lucy felt there was a tune in it, but she could not catch the tune, any more than she had been able to catch the words when the trees had so nearly talked to her the night before. But there was, at least, a lilt. She felt her own feet wanting to dance, as if in complicated country dance. And, I suppose, thought Lucy, when trees dance, it must be a very, very country dance indeed. She was almost among them now. The first tree she looked at seemed at first glance to not be a tree at all, but a huge man with a shaggy beard and great bushes of hair. She was not frightened. She had seen such things before. But when she looked again, he was only a tree, though he was still moving. You couldn't see whether he had feet or roots, of course, because when trees move, they don't walk on the surface of the earth. They wait in it as we do in water. The same thing happened with every tree she looked at. One moment they seemed to be friendly, loving giant and giantess forms which the tree people put on when some good magic has called them into full life. The next moment they all looked like trees again. But when they looked like trees, it was strangely human trees. And when they looked like people, it was strangely branchy and leafy people. 
all the time that queer lilting, rustling, cool, merry noise. They're almost awake, not quite, said Lucy. She knew she herself was wide awake, wider than anyone usually is. But she went fearlessly on among them, dancing herself at. She leapt this way and that to avoid being run into by these huge partners, but she was only half interested in them. She wanted to get beyond them to something else. It was from beyond them that the dear voice had called. She soon got through them, half wondering whether she had been using her arms to push branches aside, or to take hands in a great chain with big dancers who stooped to reach her for they were really a ring of trees around a central open place. She stepped out from among the shifting confusion of lovely lights and shadows. A circle of grass, smooth as a lawn, met her eyes, with dark trees dancing all round it. And then, oh joy, for he was there, the huge lion, shining white in the moonlight, with his huge black shadow underneath him. But for the moment of his tail, but for the movement of his tail, he might have been a stone lion. But Lucy never thought of that. She never stopped uh, to think whether he was a friendly lion or not. And she rushed to him. She felt her heart would burst if she lost a moment. And the next thing she knew, she was kissing him and putting her arms as far around his neck as she could and burying her face in the beautiful rich silkiness of his mane aslan aslan dear aslan sobbed lucy at last the great beast rolled over on his side so that lucy fell half sitting half lying between his front paws he bent forward and just touched her nose with his tongue his warm breath came all round her she gazed up into the wise face. Welcome, child, he said. Aslan, said Lucy, you're bigger. That is because you are older, little one, answered he. Not because you are? I am not, but every year you grow, you will find me bigger. For a time she was so happy that she did not want to speak, but Aslan spoke. Lucy, he said. We must not lie here for long. You have work in hand, and much time has been lost today. Yes, wasn't it a shame, said Lucy. I saw you all right. They wouldn't believe me. They're also... From somewhere deep inside Aslan's body, there came the faintest suggestion of a girl. I'm sorry, said Lucy, who understood some of his moods. I didn't mean to start slanging the others. But it wasn't my fault anyway, was it? The lion looked straight into her eyes. Oh, Aslan, you don't mean it was. How could I? I couldn't have left the others and come to you. Alone, how could I? Don't look at me like that. Oh, well, I suppose I could. Yes, and it wouldn't have been alone. I wouldn't, I know. Not if I was with you. But what would have been the good? Aslan said nothing. You mean, said Lucy rather faintly, that it would have turned out all right, somehow? But how? Please, Aslan, am I not to know? To know what would have happened, child, said Aslan. No, nobody's ever told that. Oh, dear, said Lucy. But anyone can find out what will happen, said Aslan. If you go back to the others now, and wake them up, and tell them you have seen me again, and that you m must all get up at once and follow me, what will happen? There is only one way of finding out. Do you mean that is what you want me to do? gasped Lucy. Yes, little one, said Aslan. Will the others see you too? asked Lucy. Certainly not at first, said Aslan. Later on it depends. But they won't believe me, said Lucy. It doesn't matter, said Aslan. Oh dear, oh dear, said Lucy. And I was so pleased at finding you again, and I thought you'd let me stay. 
and I thought you'd come roaring in and frighten all the enemies away like last time. And now everything is going to be horrid. It is hard for you, little one, said Aslan. But things never happen the same way twice. It has been hard for all in Narnia before now. Lucy buried her head in his mane and hid to hide from his face. There must have been magic in his mane. She could feel lion strength going into her. Quite suddenly she sat up. I'm sorry, Aslan, she said. I'm ready now. Now you are a lioness, said Aslan, and now all Narnia will be renewed. But come, we have no time to lose. He got up and walked with the stately, noiseless paces back to the belt of dancing trees through which she had just come. And Lucy went with him, laying a rather tremulous hand on his mane. The trees parted to let them through, for one second assumed their human forms completely. Lucy had a glimpse of tail of a tall and lovely wood gods and wood goddesses, all bowing to the lion. Next moment there were trees again, but still bowing, with such graceful sweeps of branch and trunk, that their bowing was itself a kind of dance. Now, child, said Aslan, when they had left the trees behind them, I will wait here. Go and wake the others and tell them to follow. If they will not, then you at least must follow me alone. It is a terrible thing to have to wake four people, all older than yourself and all very tired, for the purpose of telling them something they probably won't believe and making them do something they certainly won't like. I must just, I mustn't think about it, I must just do it, thought Lucy. She went to Peter first and shook him. Peter, she whispered in his ear, wake up, quick, Aslan is here. He says we've got to follow him at once. Certainly, Lou, whatever you like, said Peter unexpectedly. This was encouraging, but as Peter instantly rolled round and went to sleep again, it wasn't much use. Then she tried Susan. Susan really did wake up, but only to say in her most annoying grown-up voice, You've been dreaming, Lucy. Go back to sleep. She tackled Edmund next. It was very difficult to wake him, but at last, when she had done it, he was really awake and sat up. Eh, he said in a grumpy voice. What are you talking about? She said it all over again. This was one of the worst parts of her job, for each time she said it, it sounded less convincing. Aslan, said Esmond, Edmund, jumping up. Hooray, where? Lucy turned back to where she could see the lion waiting, his patient eyes fixed upon her. There, she said, pointing. Where? asked Edmund again. There, don't you see? Just this side of the trees. Edmund stared hard for a while and then said, No, there's nothing there. You got dazzled and muddled with the moonlight. One does, you know. I thought I saw something for a moment myself. It was only an optical, what do you call it? I can see him all the time, said Lucy. He's looking straight at us. Then why can't I see him? He said you mightn't be able to. Why? I don't know. That's what he said. Oh, bother it all, said Edmund. I do wish you wouldn't keep on seeing things, but I suppose we'll have to awake the others. That's the end of chapter 10.